All right, I think we're live. Uh, this is all very new, what I'm doing today. I'm not only using new software, I'm on a different uh, channel altogether, so I expect it's going to take a little bit of time uh, for folks to find their way here. Uh, so Nelson, good to see you. Uh, and I believe that if I've done everything right, that the chat's supposed to show up on the little corner here, but it doesn't appear that it is. Uh, it might be taking a little bit of time for that to happen. I don't know. Uh, like I said, I'm experimenting with all of this, so it's all fairly new to me, but we'll give a couple minutes and uh, we're going to get started. I'm just going to kind of give a little bit of um, background uh, information and uh, kind of tell you how this is going to go before we get started. And the first thing I want to say right off the bat is, uh, you, Nelson, you don't have to have seen the musical. Uh, I'm, I'm only using the musical uh, as a guide for the discussion uh, from the standpoint that uh, gives me kind of the topics surrounding Alexander Hamilton that we're going to discuss. Uh, so, Robert, hello. Um, I want to say up front, I absolutely love Hamilton. I love musical theater in general. I was not a fan of Hamilton when it first came out. When I first heard about it, I thought it was a terrible idea, like a lot of other people did. As someone who loves history, I was like, ooh, you know, I don't know. But once my daughter got into it and she really loved it, she got me sold on it. And now I absolutely love it. Uh, we got to see it live a couple of years ago on the tour when it came to Cleveland. And it was fantastic. Uh, so I highly recommend it. If you have the least bit interest in history or musical theater, check it out on Disney Plus and watch it. It'll be well worth your time. Secondly, uh, the musical Hamilton is primarily based on Ron Chernow's uh, biography of Alexander Hamilton, which is Lynn manuel Miranda, who wrote Hamilton. That was his source information that he used. And, and I've read uh, Chernow's biography. Uh, it's phenomenal. It's what led me to want to read Chernow's Grant biography, biography, which is also fantastic. I recommend both of them to you. And if you're not somebody who can sit down and read a huge book, uh, get Audible. Now, that's what I did because I travel a lot and I listen to it on Audible and it's so good. Zach Mills, hello. Robert, Sharon, hello. Um, so you can see my, my space is starting to take shape. And what you see over here, these are actually, uh, and I'll show you one of them. I'm doing up these little kind of memorial boards for each of my Civil War ancestors. That's what you see with the flags there. Uh, so they look like this. Uh, so this is Private John Mowry, who's my third great-grandfather. He was in Company K, 40th Kentucky Mountain Infantry, and it kind of shows some of the highlights of what he was uh, serving in. Uh, some of these others are just ancestors of mine. Uh, that's the USS Wyoming right there, who my great-grandfather was on. Uh, this is a letter from Harry Truman to my uncle, who was in World War II. And then right here, you see his service record uh, behind me. That's his original uh, discharge uh, record that he was given. Uh, so just kind of showing you a few things there. Uh, I have not, Mr. Allegra, I haven't seen his or read his Washington bio, but I'm definitely going to have to check that out. So uh, with that said, I'm just saying I love Hamilton. So, so by talking about the history and what it got wrong and what it got right, I'm not trashing Hamilton. I get it. Uh, in a musical, as in movies and things like that, sometimes they have to condense characters um, combine characters uh, so people are in places they never were saying things they never said for the sake of the story and I'll talk about some of those examples but Hamilton is outstanding I highly recommend it so with that in mind I'm just going to kind of work my way down through uh, there are like 40 some songs some of these we won't talk about much at all but others there's a lot to digest I'm going to kind of walk through the, the musical and talk about what was happening in the musical, what the story talks about, and what the real history is. So the first song is called Alexander Hamilton, and that's the one you're probably most likely to have seen. It's the one that kind of starts with, uh, if you're familiar with it at all, he starts with, How does a bastard, orphan, son of a whore, and a Scotsman, uh, dropped in the middle of a forgotten spot in the Caribbean, by providence improv impoverished and, sc and squalor, grow up to be a hero and a scholar. So it gives a lot of the background about who Alexander Hamilton is. So I want to talk a little bit about his history. Alexander Hamilton is born to a couple out of wedlock, uh, and that was something that haunted him his entire life, uh, on the island of Nevis in the British West Indies. And uh, he grew up on St. Croix, which is a nearby island. Uh, his mother, her uh, maiden name was Rachel Fawcett. Uh, she was half British, half French Huguenot. And uh, she had first married this guy named Peter Levian. And Peter Levian was not a good husband by all accounts. They end up separating, but because of the laws in place at that time, 
Uh, she could not get a divorce without his consent. So even though they were separated, they were no longer married, Peter Levian never granted her a divorce. And so when she meets James Hamilton, who is this fourth son of a Scottish laird named Alexander Hamilton, and being a fourth son, you're never going to inherit anything. So he comes to the Caribbean to try and make his fortune. Yes, yeah, St. Kitts and Nevis, that, that's the same place, uh, Robert. That's where Hamilton's from. Uh, he, he was born in Nevis in a town called Charlestown. Uh, so uh, James Hamilton and Rachel Fawcett uh, are unable to marry. They would have married if they were allowed to by law, but they couldn't. And so they have two children together. They have uh, a son named James and then a younger son named Alexander. And uh, Alexander, from the very beginning, is this really intelligent, bright kid that everybody kind of just can tell there's something special about him. Um, but when Alexander's a small child, uh, his father leaves and goes to another island. And as far as we can tell, Hamilton never sees his father again. They write letters. They stay in contact the rest of their lives. But as far as anybody can tell, they never saw each other face to face after that. Um, so he's just a young kid when this happens. His, uh, his mother then ends up getting, I think, yellow fever, and she dies when Alexander's like 11, 12 years old. Um, yeah, <laughs> and uh, so now he's an orphan, uh, as is his older brother. Well, his, his older brother by this point is kind of old enough to take care of himself. And so now he's an orphan, and he ends up, uh, they first go to live with this cousin, uh, and then the cousin commits suicide, and that's in the song. Uh, so it's just this one just bad break after another for this kid. He ends up being employed as a clerk for a trading company, uh, a wealthy trading company. And he, he so distinguishes himself as a like 13, 14 year old kid as a clerk that the owner of this company basically leaves him in charge. And so this kid is bossing around sailors and tradesmen and making important decisions involving uh, large sums of money and uh, these trading things that are happening. And that's where he first experiences slavery because slavery is a big part of the sugar uh, crop that's happening on this island. That's primarily what's happening there. Uh, so everybody either was a slave or probably was involved in the slave trade in some way. Uh, and that was all happening all around Alexander Hamilton. Well, then, as though you think can't, things can't possibly get any worse, a hurricane devastates the island of St. Croix, where he's living. And it's this moment, as with many moments in ha Hamilton's life, uh, where he rises up. And that's a theme in the musical. Hamilton writes a description of what happened on the island. And uh, it gets published in a local newspaper, but there, and what is just one of many times where older men recognize the promise of this young man. Uh, there's a guy who uh, ends up, um, he, hold on one second, I got this little cup thing I gotta get rid of there. Um, there's a guy who ends up, uh, I think his name was Knox, taking this and sending it to the mainland and it gets published. And suddenly everybody's like, holy cow, who is this author? This is a really brilliant mind. And that's when, for the first time, everybody uh, who's never met Hamilton hears about him and starts to realize there's something special about this kid. So uh, long story short, the people on the island of St. Croix take up a collection to sponsor Alexander Hamilton going to New York uh, going to the uh, to America uh, to get an education with the with the idea that he's going to become a doctor or something, and then he's going to turn right back around, come back to the Caribbean, and uh, offer you know his services to those people. Well, once Hamilton leaves, he never comes back. Um, so, Buffing, what are you saying? Uh, is there a problem, Nelson? Um, looks like everything's working okay. Um, so. He uh, he never comes back. So uh, this whole that song covers all of that. Uh, so he gets you know sponsored to go to the New World, and he he shows up in New York, uh, and and initially he wants to go to Princeton. Uh, Princeton's a brand new school, uh, co-founded by a guy named Aaron Burr Sr., who is the father of Hamilton's future nemesis. Um, and uh, so he finds out he's not able to quite get in there. Uh, he ends up deciding he's going to go to King's College, which today is known as Columbia University in New York. Uh, but he doesn't have 
enough of an education to do that. So he's got to take some some courses at a boarding school or something like that. And while he's doing all this, he, he meets a guy named Hercules Mulligan, uh, who is another person who will help define his future. Uh, and Hercules Mulligan is one of several people that uh, we are introduced to in the second song in Hamilton, which is called Aaron Burr, sir. He meets Aaron Burr. He meets Hercules Mulligan. Uh, he meets Marquis de Lafayette. And he meets... Uh, uh, John Lawrence. Well, it didn't quite happen that way. He didn't meet all these guys at once in a bar and s immediately become good friends with all of them. Uh, Robert, how's it going? Good to see you. Um, what he does is he meets Hercules Mulligan and Mulligan starts getting him connected with people in society. Uh, and so people start to, to get to know this teenage kid who's just come to a, a new world, you know, a thousand miles from home. And uh, he eventually goes to, uh, to Columbia University. Uh, he hasn't at this point actually met John Lawrence or Aaron Burr, I don't believe, um, or certainly not Marquis de Lafayette. Well, right when he starts uh, to go to uh, King's College uh, in New York, down there in Manhattan, uh, the Revolutionary War breaks out up in Massachusetts. Uh, Lexington and Concord, all that stuff. And, and Hamilton's immediately uh, just captured by the spirit uh, of all of this and wants to be a part of it. And one of the things that was happening... Uh, during this point in history that was a really big part of politics and a big part of all of this stuff is that people would write anonymous um, editorials, basically, to publish in local newspapers. And one of the early uh, accounts that gets published is uh, what's known as by a Westchester farmer. Uh, and we'll get to that later on, but Hamilton ends up kind of getting in a writing war with this guy. But uh, he sees the... the um, the rallies that are happening. He sees the protests that are happening. He sees how loyalists are getting treated. And he initially kind of tries to defend those people, even though he doesn't agree with those people. Uh, you'll find that in Hamilton's life, he was all about um, people who had strong opinions. Even if they were wrong, he could respect somebody who had strong beliefs, uh, principled beliefs. Um, so uh, I should mention, too, if at any point you have questions about anything or you want to add something to the discussion, please feel free to do that. I want this to be as interactive as possible. Um, otherwise, I'm just going to keep on talking. Um, and so then uh, Hamilton is looking for his opportunity. And as a kid, he had written a lot about things like how he said, oh, I wish there were a war where I could rise above my station and distinguish myself. Because he recognized that as a kid with no land, no family, uh, born to a couple out of wedlock, uh, that he really had no good prospects for getting ahead in life and some, unless something happened like a war. So he was always wishing for that. Well, lo and behold, he comes to America and a war breaks out. And so he immediately volunteers. And he ends up becoming the captain of a... Uh, company of artillery in New York. And it's actually, I believe, one of the oldest uh, still in existence military units that can trace its lineage all the way back to the beginning of our nation. Um, so he becomes this, this artillery captain. And uh, yeah, so Zach, I'll, I'll give you all the details I can about all this stuff. Um, so that's what's happening in Hamilton's life. Then the, the story shifts in Hamilton and it starts showing the story of the Schuyler sisters. Uh, Angelica, Eliza and Peggy, Margarita was her name, but she went by Peggy, um, uh, are the three oldest children out of like 15 children uh, of Major General Philip Schuyler, who uh, was a Revolutionary War commander who I think was primarily uh, in command of upstate New York, which is where he lived up in Albany. Um, he, Robert, at that point in history, uh, you were elected captain of a unit. Even, in the Revol even all the way up to the Civil War, a lot of volunteer units... Uh, would elect their officers. And so Hamilton was chosen by the other men to be the captain. I think he was like 19 years old at that point. Uh, so that's why he got to be captain, because he helped he helped organize the unit, and then they made him the captain of it. Um, so now we see the story of, of Angelica, Peggy, and Eliza Schuyler. Uh, now, Peggy is kind of spun as the younger sister who doesn't know much, who really is kind of an afterthought in the story. But um, well, Mr. Allegra, at this point, Hamilton had like six months of a college education. Uh, he didn't actually finish his uh, education for his law degree until after the war was over. Um, yeah, so uh, yeah, so he, he was not yet a lawyer until several years after the revolution. Um, 
So Peggy actually ends up marrying a guy named uh, Stephen Van Rensselaer, uh, who, if adjusted for inflation, was one of the 10 richest men who ever lived in history. Uh, Richer than Elon Musk, richer than Jeff Bezos, people like that. I think something like in today's dollars, his his wealth was something like $400 billion today. Uh, So Peggy did really well for herself, uh, but she doesn't really get to be much of the story. Uh, Angelica and Eliza are the story because it's not an understatement to say that Alexander Hamilton had two women in his life. It's such a weird, weird relationship that Hamilton ends up having with his sister-in-law, which is who uh, Angelica ends up becoming. But, um, But we're not there yet. Uh, So we're introduced to these daughters of Philip Schuyler, uh, who's a very wealthy man himself uh, and and is a major general in the Continental Army. Okay, so then we get to a song called Farmer Refuted, which is the sixth song. It's really cool because uh, this is where a Westchester farmer who was a a bishop uh, named Samuel Seabury, uh, who was a loyalist, who was writing these strong defenses um, of the... uh, Robert, the, the way that a man in the late 1700s gets so rich is land. Uh, Philip, or, uh, Stephen Van Rensselaer had a ton of land. And after the Revolutionary War, uh, what ends up happening is west of the Allegheny uh, Mountains, uh, the Appalachian Mountains, which had been off limits by the British government, were suddenly opened up. And so there's all this new land available. And people gobbled up that land and then turned around and sold it uh, and made a huge profit. Um, so that was primarily how people got to be wealthy then, especially in the North where there wasn't a lot of slavery. Um, so Farmer Refuted is, uh, a series of letters that Hamilton wrote to the newspaper where he refuted what a Westchester farmer, the anonymous name for Samuel Seabury was writing in defense of the British government. Hamilton starts writing against, uh, writing in defense of the, um, the revolution and it's just one of those times when people starts to people start to to notice the intellect of alexander hamilton that song goes right into one of my favorite songs which is called you'll be back and that's when king george the third walks out on stage uh and basically if i understand right what king george the third is doing at this point is this is meant to be his olive branch petition response in 1775 the revolution was largely a New England problem. And that's how it was viewed by the rest of the colonies. Uh, Pennsylvania, Virginia, Carolinas, they kind of saw that as Massachusetts problem, New England's problem. It wasn't their war. They didn't want to get dragged into a conflict with the mother country. And so they were doing everything they could to try and, um, to try and make peace and reconcile with the British government. Um, yeah, Mr. Allegra was, uh, you're right, Washington was very involved in early land speculation of that sort, especially in the western part of Virginia, because uh, Virginia at that time owned all the way into what is now Kentucky, uh, Tennessee, part of that. Um, so uh, the Olive, Olive Branch petition was an attempt by the Continental Congress to stave off full-blown war by all 13 colonies. Uh, so they sent this petition to the king saying, listen, if you'll just hear us out on some of our grievances, we'll, we'll, we'll end the rebellion. We'll stop. We don't want to fight. We want to reconcile. And King George's response was basically, uh, our faithful subjects are being misled by these horrible people in this Congress and they need to lay down their arms or they're going to be arrested for treason. And, uh, commander Thorne, that's okay. We are just getting started. There's still plenty to be talked about. So um, so uh, King George comes out and he sings this song, which is basically a breakup song to the colonies, saying, you'll be back. And that leads into uh, the next words you hear after that song are, British Admiral Howe's got troops on the water, 32,000 troops in New York Harbor. So these brothers, Admiral Howe and General Howe, uh, they invade New York City. Uh, This is a massive British force that has come to put down the rebellion. And right about the time that the Continental Congress is passing uh, the Resolution for Independence and and signing the Declaration of Independence, this massive British force is landing in New York City to put down the rebellion. Um, 
Do I think the southern part of the colonies would have fought a proxy war? No. You know what? I think they wanted to avoid that. I think loyalist sentiment was much stronger in the Carolinas, for example. Uh, and if the king had shown the slightest willingness to reconcile, to meet the colonies halfway on some of their grievances, I don't think the South would have been a part of the revolution. Um, because they had to have all 13 colonies on board. The, the, Revol the Declaration of Independence ended up being 12 in favor, one abstention. And the only reason New York abstained is because they hadn't been given the okay to vote for independence by their constituent assembly back in New York. Uh, so they abstained. Uh, so there's massive invasion force. Uh, yes, absolutely, Commander Thorne. I highly recommend Hamilton. I'm just kind of kind of talking through some of the history and clearing up some of what maybe wasn't exactly the way it actually happened. Uh, this massive invasion force lands in New York City to put down the rebellion, and this is the darkest hour uh, for Washington. I don't think the darkest moments for the Continental Army was um, Valley Forge. Valley Forge wasn't even the worst winter the, Col the Continental Army experienced. It was the winter at Morristown, most likely. Um, but uh, it, Washington is facing uh, a difficult situation, uh, and he almost loses his whole army uh, in New York when the British land. Uh, there's a series of battles that kind of push Washington off of Long Island, push him out of Manhattan back to Harlem. They get uh, surprised at Kipps Bay. Washington bungles the defense, splits his forces, loses a, a division of troops that are captured, uh, surrendering one of the forts. Uh, but it's this moment when Washington first notices Alexander Hamilton because Alexander Hamilton's leading this uh, battery that he's the captain of. And he does so with bravery when a lot of other troops are running, when a lot of other people are, are running away. In fact, there's this scene during the, uh, landing, the British landing at Kipps Bay, and it's in the uh, Hamilton musical where Washington is just beside himself at how people are running. And he says, are these the men with which I am to, def I am to defend America? But it's during this time that he notices that Hamilton isn't like a lot of those others, and he takes notice of Hamilton. Other people had taken notice of Hamilton, too. People like Nathaniel Green, Henry Knox, some of Washington's leading generals, tried to hire Hamilton as a staff member, but Hamilton wasn't interested in being on somebody's staff. He wanted to fight. So by this point, we're told that uh, in the musical that Hamilton has become friends with Marquis de Lafayette and with John Lawrence. Well, he hasn't met these guys yet. Marquis de Lafayette's not even in America yet. Uh, Lafayette comes in 1777. He's one of a number of foreign officers who show up with letters from people like Ben Franklin in Paris saying, hey, put this guy in a staff position somewhere. And so all of these German and French officers are showing up expecting to be given some title because of who they are. Uh, and a lot of them get, get, uh, are given these like honorary major general titles. But Washington sees something in Lafayette when he comes in 1777 and gives him real command, gives him opportunities. And one of the reasons why Hamilton and Lafayette end up hitting it off is Hamilton speaks fluent French. So he can communicate with this guy who just showed up from France not speaking much English. Lafayette was only like 20 years old himself. Two of the most important people in the Revolutionary War are Alexander Hamilton and Marquis de Lafayette, and they were both like 20 years old. Um, no, uh, Robert, it's actually a musical. Well, it's, well yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a movie now, uh, but it's a musical play movie. Uh, the movie is actually just like a, a movie version of the musical uh, that was filmed on stage. So now we get into the song called Right Hand Man, which is where Hamilton and Washington meet. Uh, and this didn't actually historically happen until after the Battle of Trenton. Uh, you know, Washington crosses the Delaware. He takes the Hessians at Trenton. Hamilton was still a uh, artillery captain at this time. Now, a lot of movies skew that. Like there's a movie called The Crossing with Jeff Daniels playing George Washington. And you see Alexander Hamilton as a member of Washington's staff at that point, but he wasn't. He was still an artillery captain at that point. Uh, Mr. Allegra, you're thinking of Baron von Steuben, uh, who was the guy who showed up and ended up kind of whipping the army into shape afterwards. Um, uh, where does Hamilton learn French? His mother was French, uh, and he grew up uh, in St. Croix, where a lot of people sp spoke French, so it was kind of required for him growing up where he did and growing up with French grandparents. Um, so right-hand man is where Washington invites 
Hamilton to become a member of his staff. Now, remember, Hamilton wants to fight. He wants the glory of combat. But when the commander-in-chief of the Continental Army says, I need you, you don't say no. And so Hamilton joins Washington's staff and basically becomes his chief of staff. This young 21 or 20 year old kid bossing around generals. Uh, Washington's trust in Hamilton is so complete that he almost lets Hamilton issue orders for him. Hamilton is running things for George Washington from that point forward in 1777. This is when he becomes friends, lifelong friends with John Lawrence. Uh, John Lawrence's father is Henry Lawrence, who ends up becoming the uh, the successor to um, John Hancock as the president of the Continental Congress. Henry Lawrence, I think, ends up getting captured by the British, and I think he ends up in the Tower of London for a while. Um, but John Lawrence is from South Carolina. He's a young guy who, even though he's from South Carolina, believes very strongly in equipping and uh, empowering black soldiers to fight. Uh, now, the Revolutionary War is the last time that black and white soldiers fight in the same unit together uh, until Vietnam. Um, Revolutionary War had happened, but then after that, uh, you know, in the Civil War, in the Indian Wars, in World War I, World War II, black soldiers had their own units, sometimes with white officers. But uh, Lawrence was all about, he wanted to raise and equip entire battalions of black soldiers to get him into the field. Uh, so Lawrence was very much ahead of his time in that, especially for a Southerner, which is really impressive. Um, so can you ask exactly what a general's chief of staff does exactly? Um, well, it was pretty vague because technically Hamilton was not, uh, didn't have the title of chief of staff. He he was a de facto chief of staff. He was a member of what Washington called his family. John Lawrence, Aaron Burr was a member of the staff for a while. Um, he had these men that helped kind of run, uh, you know, answer letters, uh, organize things, make sure that, you know, copies of orders go out to people. They're basically like glorified secretaries. But Hamilton had much more power and much more authority than that. It's very vague. Uh, there was no official title given to Hamilton, uh, but he basically was given a lot of authority in that way. But he was constantly writing letters to Congress on behalf of Washington saying, here's what we need in terms of supplies. Uh, he helped run Washington's spy ring, um, which you see a lot of in the series Turn, Washington Spies. Uh, the man I mentioned earlier, Hercules Mulligan, who had taken Hamilton under his wing, uh, is a big part of that series Turn, Washington Spies. So the one line, there would have been nothing left to do for someone less astute. Uh, yeah, uh, he would have been dead or destitute without a cent of restitution. He started working, clerking for his late mother's landlord, trading sugar cane and rum and all the things he can't afford, scamming for every book he can get his hands on, planning for the future. Uh, so yeah, uh, other people would not have been able to rise above like Hamilton did. Uh, so yeah, in that first song, they're talking a lot about how he used his brain to get ahead in life. So now he's on Washington's staff, and it's as a member of Washington's staff that uh, he gets involved in a duel for the first time. Uh, and this actually takes place much later in the musical, in, a, in Song 15, which is called uh, The Ten Duel Commandments. They kind of mix up the timeline a little bit. But there was this thing called the Conway Cabal. All throughout Washington's time as commander-in-chief, there were all of these other generals who thought they could do it better. Um, Hercules Mulligan, Robert, is in the last season. Uh, he, he's an Irish guy who is a tailor uh, who spies on the British because he's working on their uniforms and everything. He's mostly in the last season. You'll see Hercules Mulligan. Um, but so uh, Hamilton is you know, fiercely defensive of George Washington, who he sees as like a father figure to him. Washington's in his 40s at this point. Hamilton's just barely 20, didn't have a father growing up. And so, Ham you know, Washington has become a father figure to him. This Conway cabal was named after Thomas Conway, who was a brigadier general and who was part of the, um, the group of this committee who was involved in kind of running the war. Um, there were other generals, uh, Charles Lee specifically, who wanted secretly to get rid of Washington because they thought they should be in charge. 
Uh, Conway ends up being shot in the mouth in a duel because of what happened. Uh, but the duel that we see in the musical Hamilton uh, takes place between John Lawrence and General Charles Lee. Uh, because what happens is Charles Lee, uh, who has been constantly trying to undermine George Washington. Nelson, welcome back. Uh, Charles Lee gets given second in command uh, under George Washington. Um, is he the guy that Arnold arrests? Yes, he is. Uh, Hercules Mulligan is the guy that Arnold arrests in the first episode of season four. Um, so Charles Lee is put in command of the vanguard of the attack on the British rear uh, at the Battle of Monmouth. And uh, he immediately starts retreating. And George Washington, he is a fiction. No, he's a real character in Assassin's Creed. Um, so Charles Lee uh, orders a retreat. And George Washington shows up on the field. And he is just absolutely livid that Charles Lee has retreated when he should have been attacking the British. And uh, no, Charles Lee is not related to Robert E. Lee. Robert E. Lee's father was Light Horse Harry Lee who was a cavalry uh, officer during the war. Uh, both were from Virginia. but uh, So Charles Lee orders this retreat. Washington confronts him on the battlefield and, and basically relieves him of command on the battlefield, puts Lafayette in command uh, of Charles Lee's position for that attack. He takes the attack on in, and as the musical says, we snatch a stalemate from the jaws of defeat. And it looked like a sure defeat under Charles Lee, but Lafayette ends up managing to to get a, a draw out of the battle. It was 100 degrees that day. A lot of men died of heat stroke. Uh, Charles Lee is disgraced at that point, uh, and uh, it starts bad-mouthing Washington openly to anybody who would listen. And Lee had actually been captured by the British, and some people think that the British had turned him and he was openly undermining the uh, British command, or the uh, American command. But John Lawrence challenges Charles Lee to a duel, and this duel is portrayed in Hamilton. Now they show Aaron Burr as the second for Charles Lee. He wasn't, it was a different guy, but Alexander Hamilton was the second for John Lawrence at this duel. And John Lawrence actually shoots Charles Lee in the chest. Uh, in the side. Lee survives the wounds, but he never serves in combat again after that. Uh, Hamilton is the Revolutionary War, yeah. Yeah, uh, so you you do see that in Turn Washington Spies. You see uh, Charles Lee being dismissed. You don't see the duel. Uh, but So that's Hamilton's first of many experiences with duels, which will end up defining the end of his life. Uh, he ends up meeting as a member of Washington's staff in 1780. He meets Eliza Schuyler and ends up marrying her. Now, one of the things that they show in the Hamilton musical is they show Angelica Schuyler as lamenting the fact that she basically backs off uh, where she wanted to marry Hamilton herself. Uh, but the fact is, Angelica was already married to a man named John Barker Church by this time. Uh, who John Barker Church is a British guy who ends up being in the British Parliament for a while after he and Angelica marry. So Angelica's already married at this point when uh, Alexander Hamilton has this whirlwind courtship with Eliza. He marries her, and they have this really cool scene then when they're having kind of a drinking party, uh, like a bachelor party for Hamilton, um, where he's with Lafayette, uh, Hercules Mulligan, um, and John Lawrence, and they're celebrating his uh, his marriage, and they're saying, yeah, uh, they talk about Hamilton as being the newly not poor of us, because Hamilton has married into a very wealthy family, whereas he has no money of his own. The only thing he has going for him is his proximity to power, because he's on Washington's staff. So then, in the musical, Aaron Burr shows up at the end of the bachelor party, and all the other guys hate Aaron Burr. Uh, and Aaron Burr it kind of shows up, and he's had a command of his own. He's a lieutenant colonel by this time. Hamilton's a lieutenant colonel as a member of Washington's staff, uh, but Burr's got a combat command, and Hamilton wants that. Uh, and then now we're introduced to Aaron Burr's story, and we find out that Burr is uh, secretly seeing this woman named Theodosia, who's married to a British officer, which is all true. Uh, Aaron Burr, continental officer, uh, having an affair with a woman married to a British officer. Well, her husband ends up dying, um, I think down in Georgia or in the Caribbean or something. And, uh, and Burr ends up marrying this woman named Theodosia. But now we get a glimpse into Aaron Burr, his psyche, what motivates him, what he's all about. 
And what Aaron Burr is all about is political opportunism. Whereas Hamilton's life is defined by strong uh, beliefs, by principle. Aaron Burr is all about what's going to get me in power, what's going to get me ahead. And so this song called Wait For It is where he talks about how I'm just going to wait and see what happens. And when I see my opportunity, I'm going to take it. And that's what defines Aaron Burr's life. And that's why eventually he and Hamilton, who are in pr close proximity all their lives to each other, why they eventually butt heads. Now, Aaron Burr has this incredible history of his own. He was also orphaned at like two years old. His father, Aaron Burr Sr., is the president of Princeton University, helps found that university. Uh, his mother was the daughter of Jonathan Edwards, uh, who Jonathan Edwards was this, uh, as it is described in the musical, fire and brimstone preacher. Uh, he, he's the one who preaches this sermon called Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. Uh, and so that's Burr's upbringing. He's brought up by these powerfully outspoken people in his family, but he comes from wealth and privilege, whereas Hamilton does not. He has everything handed to him. Hamilton has to fight and scrap his way for everything. And so those things will eventually butt heads, uh, as you guys have said. A clash of egos, a clash of beliefs, a, class, a clash of motivations. So they go their separate ways, and they don't see each other really until after the war at that point. Uh, so at this point now, Hamilton ends up clashing with, with uh, George Washington. Because over and over and over again, all Hamilton wants is a chance to fight. And he, he keeps asking Washington, put me in the field, give me a command. And Washington says, no, you're too valuable to me on my staff. I can't possibly risk you losing your life. And so eventually Hamilton resigns as a member of Washington's staff. But he doesn't go home as portrayed in the musical. He kind of waits around and kind of hangs out in the camp. And his opportunity comes at Yorktown. So uh, I'm not going to get into all the history, but basically uh, what has happened is um, Lafayette goes back to France and he gets guns and ships as described in the musical. Uh, and he, he gets more support from the French government. He brings guns, but mostly the most important thing is that he brings the French fleet. And the French fleet is the defining factor because they defeat the British uh, in the Battle of the Chesapeake. They run off the British Navy, and now uh, George Washington has uh, Lord Cornwallis cornered in Yorktown with the French Navy on one side and his army combined with the French army on the other side. Um, yeah, Robert, we're going to get into that, Burr and Jefferson. That's a big part of the story, and we're going to get to that uh, pretty soon. That's one of the defining moments of Burr's life, but also Hamilton's life. Uh, and Hamilton's clashes with Jefferson will define his life as well, and we're going to get into that really soon. Uh, so now they've got the British surrounded. In order to be able to complete the siege, they've got to take what are known as redoubts 9 and 10 which, long story short, are the last part of the British outer defenses that need to be taken. And this is when Washington goes to Hamilton and says, okay, here's your chance. You want to command? I'm going to put you in command of this attack. And so now the musical in the song Yorktown says um, that John Lawrence is in South Carolina Redefining bravery is how it describes it. But no, that is not the case. That's one of the biggest historical no-nos in all of Hamilton is when they say that Hamilton's off fighting in South Carolina during the Battle of Yorktown. No, or that Lawrence is off fighting in South Carolina. No, Lawrence was part of the attack that Hamilton was in. And so was Lafayette. Lafayette was in command of this attack. Uh, Hamilton's in command of a battalion on the ground and Lawrence is there with him. And uh, so they lead this attack in the middle of the night, Hamilton issues orders to his battalion to fix bayonets, but not to load their guns. In the musical, they say, take the bullets out your gun. Take the bullets out your gun. We move under cover and we move as one. Through the night, we have one shot to live another day. We will not let a stray gunshot give us away. We will fight up close. 
Now seize the moment and stay in it. It's either that or meet the business end of a bayonet. And then they say the code word is Rochambeau. And this is really cool because that's one of those little things, little details that I love about Hamilton. The code word was indeed Rochambeau for that attack. Uh, so I love that he fits that in there. And so Lawrence, Hamilton, Lafayette, they're all part of this attack on readouts 9 and 10. And by all accounts, Hamilton is incredibly brave, distinguishes himself in this bayonet attack, and they take readouts 9 and 10 with very few casualties, and that seals the British fate. And so now Hamilton can say, I led troops in combat in the defining battle of the Revolutionary War. Uh, Zach, he's absolutely pivotal, and we'll talk about that uh, pretty soon. Uh, Hamilton is, is, is one of the, the most important founding fathers. Uh, he's one of the most forgotten, uh, but we, our country doesn't look like it does without Alexander Hamilton. We'll talk about how that happened uh, pretty soon. The admiral in French, uh, charge of the French Navy was Comte de Grasse, I believe was his name, uh, was the name of the French. And, and they only had a window of a couple of weeks because the French Navy said, you've got to do it now because we're heading back to the Caribbean before too long. Uh, and it could have gone a different way because uh, General Clinton, who's now in command of the British Army overall in America, refused to send troops to help out with Cornwallis. And that kind of sealed Cornwallis's fate. So they win at Yorktown. And so now there's victory. Uh, everything's going great. And so now we come to what happens now. Uh, and by this point, Hamilton's firstborn child is born, a son named Philip. Uh, who we will talk about uh, here pretty soon. Uh, we're getting near the end of the first act of Hamilton. Uh, and what happens now is that Hamilton goes back to New York, and he and Burr both finish their law degrees and become lawyers. And here's one of the, the most amazing uh, things that happens. Hamilton, who's already had some brushes with history now, goes back, becomes a lawyer, and he is hired to, define, to defend a man named Levi Weeks in what becomes the very first murder trial in the history of the brand new American nation. Uh, Levi Weeks was accused of murdering his fiance and I believe dumping her body in a well. And Weeks declared his innocence, said it wasn't him that did it. And he puts together a law team, kind of a dream team, that includes Alexander Hamilton and Aaron Burr. Aaron Burr and Alexander Hamilton are co-counsel in, in the very first murder trial in the history of the United States. And they do such an amazing job that they get the guy off. And he probably wasn't guilty. And there's this really cool scene where they describe how Hamilton had all the other lights off in the courtroom and held up uh, a candle to his face for dramatic effect and kind of walks them through why Levi Weeks could not possibly have committed this crime. And it was dramatic. It was like something you'd see on Law and & Order. And they win. They win the trial. So, um, yeah, your ego is going to skyrocket when you do Jefferson. Do you know a lot about Jefferson? Is that why, Robert? Yeah, we're getting to Jefferson very soon here, actually, in just a couple of minutes. Uh, so that happens. So Hamilton sets up a really lucrative, lucrative law practice, and he's doing really well for himself as a lawyer. He's making a lot of money, uh, so he gets a nice house. They start having children. Uh, he crosses paths with, with Burr a lot because they're two of the most prominent lawyers. They were both, both also kind of involved in politics. Hamilton's very outspoken about the need for a strong central government that is just not happening with the Articles of Confederation that they're living under. So he becomes one of the first people to really speak out in favor of the need for a, a United States Constitution. Long story short, he gets selected to be one of, I think, three delegates from the state of New York to be uh, in the Constitutional Convention. Uh, so Hamilton goes to the Constitutional Convention, and when it's his turn to speak, he stands up and he speaks for six hours Six hours without anybody else speaking, without taking a break for somebody else to have a turn. Six hours the man speaks. What he spoke about for six hours, I don't know. Um, because James Monroe is the guy who um, was supposed to be keeping notes. But they had agreed they weren't going to publish the notes. They wanted them kept private because they didn't want people... Uh, they wanted to be able to debate honestly 
without worrying about their words being used against them later. So Monroe kept notes, but we don't really know exactly what Hamilton said during these six hours. Um, Nelson, thank you for that. I actually may end up a history teacher at some point. I'd love to. I've always wanted to be. Um, I got to finish a few college credits to be able to do that. And I'm working on that, but, um, the first filibuster. Yeah, that's about it. Um, so we don't know exactly what he said, but we, we have an idea of what Hamilton proposed, uh, because a lot of people for the rest of Hamilton's career, the words that he spoke in the constitutional convention are used against him, uh, because he was a strong pro proponent of hereditary, uh, titles, uh, so people like in the Senate, for example, inheriting like a House of Lords where you pass down your seat in the Senate to the next generation, lifetime titles. He wanted the uh, office of president to be a lifetime appointment. Uh, so people very strongly accused him, and in some cases, rightly so, of being a monarchist and being pro-British in his policies. Uh, and that's, that's largely true, uh, but that was used against him for what he argued for there. Uh, but he ends up supporting the Constitution. And he, along with John Jay and James Monroe, get together uh, once the Constitution is signed. And Alexander Hamilton's signature is on the Constitution. George Washington was the president of the Constitu Constitutional Convention. So again, he gets to see Hamilton in action, sees what he's capable of. And uh, once the Constitution is adopted, now it's got to be ratified by all 13 states. They've got to get at least nine, I think, to ratify it. And it was hardly a done deal that that was going to happen. Uh, a lot of people were going to take some convincing uh, in order to pass uh, to ratify the, con the Constitution. So Hamilton, John Jay, who's also from New York, and James Monroe from Virginia get together and they decide that they're going to start writing a series of essays uh, to promote the Constitution anonymously. They're going to write 25 of them, and each of them are going to write about eight of these essays. Well, as you learn in the musical, John Jay gets sick after writing five, and he drops out. Uh, John, James Monroe writes like 21 or something like that. They end up writing 80 or so essays. Uh, over six months. And Hamilton writes 51 of these essays. It's described. Yeah, John Jay, absolutely. He's a forgotten founding father, much like Hamilton is. Uh, John Jay ends up Chief Justice of the United States. Uh, he was very prominent in New York politics and largely forgotten as a founding father. Um, so Hamilton writes the vast majority, 51 of the what are known as the Federalist Papers. Uh, these started as these anonymous essays. And I think he wrote under the pseudonym of Publius was his title uh, for those. Um, but the Federalist Papers to this day are used by the United States Supreme Court when they want to try and understand what the Founding Fathers intended in the Constitution. Uh, the Federalist, pa Federalist Papers are the most referred to documents in Supreme Court decisions to this day. Uh, and Hamilton wrote most of those papers. So he is one of the the founding fathers of our uh, our government in that sense. And these things help convince uh, some of the people on the fence to come off the fence and support the Constitution. Uh, so now George Washington's the only guy that anybody thinks should be president of the United States. Uh, so he's president. And the Constitution, excuse me, I'm going to take a sip of this. The Constitution really doesn't spell out exactly what uh, the cabinet positions should look like or even what those are supposed to be. So that's really largely up to Washington and his cabinet to define the role of president, the role of cabinet. Uh, much of what we know and what we believe to have been the intention of the Constitution when it comes to an attorney general and the role of the president those aren't really spelled out in the Constitution. So it was up to the first people to take office to define those roles for future generations. And so Washington initially wants uh, this really well-known economist uh, to have the role of Secretary of the Treasury. Uh, but the man's not willing to take on the job. 
Uh, I'm trying to remember off the top of my head who it was. Um, but it wasn't Alexander Hamilton. Hamilton wasn't Washington's first choice for Treasury Secretary. It was a good friend of his. Uh, and if you give me a second, I'll actually look up. Uh, I'm just going to look this up. Robert Morris was the guy. He was a good friend of George Washington's. There's a Robert Morris University to this day. I think it's in Pennsylvania, maybe Virginia. I don't remember. Um, but Robert Morris turns it down, and everybody kind of around Robert Morris is like, you know, if you want a treasury secretary, you want somebody who's brilliant in finances, Alexander Hamilton's your guy. And Ham Washington didn't need much convincing because he loved Alexander Hamilton. He knew Hamilton's mind. He knew what he was capable of. So here's Alexander Hamilton. He's about 30 years old at this point. And Washington says, will you be my treasury secretary? So Hamilton is hired as the first se uh, secretary of the treasury. Uh, Henry Knox, who had been a general under Washington, is the secretary of war. And now... Uh, Washington needs a Secretary of State. So, uh, over all the way in, yeah, you do see, Nelson, you do see the USS Wyoming right there. Uh, yeah, there it is. That's the USS Wyoming. Um, so, Washington wants Thomas Jefferson uh, as Secretary of State. Jefferson is the U.S. ambassador to France, and he's been in France for quite a while. By this point, his wife has passed away. He's starting to have children with Sally Hemings, who was actually, I don't know if you know this, but uh, most people know that Jefferson had children with his slave, Sally Hemings. Not a lot of people know that Sally Hemin Hemings was the half-sister of Thomas Jefferson's wife. Uh, they were both daughters of the same man, the same white man, who owned Sally Hemings' uh, mother and had Sally with him. So she looked a lot like Jefferson's wife. Um, so Jefferson finally decides that he's coming home from France. And uh, Jefferson shows up uh, in Monticello, uh, in Charlottesville, Virginia, to a letter letting him know that not only has he been, a, uh, been nominated by George Washington to be Secretary of State, but oh, by the way, the Senate has already confirmed you. You are the Secretary of State. Congratulations. So Jefferson no sooner shows up back home in Monticello for the first time in like a decade than now he's off to New York City, which is the capital of the United States at that time, to take office as Secretary of State. And this is where the clash begins. At this point, Hamilton and Jefferson have never met. However, Jefferson knows a lot about Hamilton because Jefferson, while in Europe, had met Angelica Church, Hamilton's sister-in-law and had actually flirted some with her. Uh, Angelica and her brother-in-law, uh, Alexander Hamilton, I alluded to this earlier, had a very strange relationship. And you see that in the musical. Um, they openly flirted with each other. Any reasonable person who knew them and saw how they talked to each other, and certainly if they saw their letters to each other, would have concluded that they were having an affair. Uh, they were very openly flirtatious uh, about, uh, there's no evidence they ever had an affair, but it sure looked that way uh, based on their relationship. And Eliza, his wife, was fully aware of the way that Hamilton and, and her sister talked to each other. Uh, but anyway, so uh, Angelica Church, uh, Hamilton's uh, sister-in-law, knows Jefferson. Well, now Jefferson and Hamilton meet for the first time, and they are complete polar opposites. Jefferson is a, uh, today you'd call him a states' rights guy. He's all about Virginia being the, the, the strong power uh, and the, cent the central federal government being as weak as possible. Whereas Hamilton's the exact opposite. He's all about a powerful executive, a power uh, residing in the central government and not with the states. And... Um, yeah, Jefferson was the late 1700s, Hugh Hefner, yes. Yeah, something like that. Uh, no, Jefferson and Hamilton hated each other. And we're going to talk about some of that here now. Uh, it starts out okay, um, but it doesn't last. Because one of the very first things that happens when Hamilton gets into office, Hamilton doesn't do anything small. 
Hamilton is one of those go big or go home guys. Um, yeah, uh, what was normal then is difficult to fathom now. If one was to conjecture a character, one must consider if uh, said individual would do the same in today's. Dread Minion, that's an absolutely great point. That's why I, I really hate when we try to judge uh, people from other eras of history on today's standards. It's really unfair for us to do that. We can recognize, for example, uh, that slavery was evil and it was not a good thing uh, and not excuse people who own slavery without necessarily equating people who were part of that society as automatically being evil. Um, yeah, Jefferson in some ways would be a modern day Republican. Um, in terms of the focus on states' rights and wanting small government. Um, I wouldn't go so far as to say that he's exactly a modern-day Republican um, because the parties don't look like they did then. Um, but Jefferson, uh, definitely very close to the Democratic Party of the Civil War era, um, you know, in terms of conservative, uh, pro-slavery, pro-South, Hamilton's pro-central government. Um, so, anyway... Hamilton immediately when he gets into power starts growing the office of treasury to the point where Henry Knox, who's the secretary of war, had something like eight employees in the, in the war department. I think eight. I think that was the max he ever had. Hamilton had hundreds of employees at the treasury. That's how huge and how powerful the treasury was. A lot of people said that Hamilton was a de facto prime minister for George Washington, that Hamilton was really the guy who was running the government, and Washington was more of a figurehead. Um, so, uh, Robert, we're talking about uh, the Washington administration. Jefferson's the Secretary of State, Hamilton's the Secretary of Treasury. They're by far the most two influential, two most influential members of Washington's government. Um, Hamilton starts growing the treasury and his big first proposal is, well, we need to assume all of the state debts incurred during the Revolutionary War. So he wants to take North Carolina's debt and Virginia's debt and uh, New York's debt, and Massachusetts debt and pay off all of that debt and have the, the federal government assume that debt. And by assuming that debt, now they're able... You know, it's just like today where you got to get a credit card to start um, developing credit for yourself, uh, establishing credit. Uh, the federal government was going to do the same thing by assuming that debt. They were going to start to establish a line of credit. Um, and so he's trying to get the, the new country off on the right foot financially. And Jefferson is absolutely horrified by this idea because, number one, he sees that as a accumulation of power by the central government. But number two, as a guy from Virginia, Virginia has largely paid off their debts, uh, whereas most of the northern states haven't. Uh, so he opposes this idea because it's going to hurt Virginia and help states who haven't paid their debts off so far. So Hamilton and, and Jefferson start having this debate about this. Um, uh, yes, Hamilton established... Let me tell you some of the things that Hamilton established. Hamilton established the National Bank, and we're going to get to that in a minute. Hamilton founded what is today called the New York Post. Hamilton founded the Coast Guard. Uh, so all of those things uh, are things that Hamilton's directly responsible for today. Um, so Hamilton wants to establish a national bank to assume this debt. Uh, Georgia says, Team Thomas Jefferson. All right. Um, Jefferson's absolutely opposed to this. And so they're at an impasse because Hamilton doesn't have the votes to get this done. Uh, meanwhile, there's also a debate going on about the future site of the U.S. Capitol. Are they going to keep it in New York? Are they going to move it to Philadelphia? Are they going to build a new city somewhere? And there's no agreement on that because everybody, New York people want it in New York. Philadelphia people want it in Philadelphia. Southerners want it to be on the banks of the Potomac. They can't agree on any of this. So... Thomas Jefferson, James Monroe, and Alexander Hamilton get together at what's called the dinner table compromise. They get together in New York City, and they meet to... The Coast Guard was uh, basically it was a bunch of privateers. Uh, it was basically uh, revenue cutters. It was called the revenue cutter uh, service, I think, at the time. Um, 
because at this point, and I'm getting a little ahead of myself, um, the federal government's only real source of revenue, because there's no income tax, there's no real property tax for the federal government. The federal government's only real source of revenue is taxes on imports, uh, tariffs. Uh, so that's why it was so important to make sure that people weren't importing goods without being taxed on them because the government needed that revenue. Uh, oh, we got a tropical storm warning. Be safe, man. Um, so Hamilton, Jefferson, Monroe get together and they hash out a compromise. James Monroe is a member of the House of Representatives at this time. And so he says, here's what we're going to do. We'll get you your votes for the assumption plan, the, the assumption of state debt and the establishment of a national bank. We'll get you your votes in the House to pass that if you will get your New York people to support the Southern proposal to build uh, a city of Washington, D.C. on the banks of the Potomac River uh, out of land carved from Virginia and Maryland. And so Hamilton says, okay, let's make it happen. That's the song Robert just alluded to it. It's called The Room Where It Happened. And this is where Aaron Burr is seeing that people are making decisions that he has no part in. And by this point, Aaron Burr is actually a senator. Aaron Burr gets elected Senate uh, to the Senate from New York. Uh, and guess who he defeats to take that Senate seat? Philip Schuyler, Alexander Hamilton's father-in-law. So there's another source of conflict. Uh, Aaron Burr basically jumps ship. Uh, by, by this point, political parties are starting to form, and I'm getting a little ahead of myself with that. But political parties are starting to form, and Aaron Burr kind of jumps from Hamilton's side of the equation to the anti-federalists uh, of, of Jefferson's camp in order to run against Philip Schuyler for the Senate seat. He gets elected to the Senate seat and becomes a member of the Senate, but he's still kind of outside of the decision-making that's happening. Um, Mr. Laker, I'm with you too. I'm not, and I know this will offend some of the people in the chat, not a fan of Thomas Jefferson at all. I do not like the man, and I'll explain why pretty soon. It's not so much for his political stances. I, I don't agree with some of Jefferson's political stances, but I understand them. It's much more about his personal behavior, which I'm going to get to in a minute, that I don't like about Thomas Jefferson. And, and Hamilton was guilty of some of that, too, as well. Um, so, hey, we're an hour in. Uh, we've probably got at least a half hour or so to go on this, but I hope you guys are having a good time so far. Make sure to hit that like button if you haven't already. Somebody hit the dislike. I'm sad now. Um, but um, did Burr not like Jefferson and Monroe either? Burr liked Burr. I think Aaron, Burr's on, Aaron Burr was only a fan of Aaron Burr. Um, he was a political opportunist, and so he liked whoever was going to get him ahead. So anyway, Hamilton wins this battle and his authority and his power only get magnified because of this uh, assumption plan and that now he's given all this power. Well, while this is all going on is the beginning of the end for Alexander Hamilton's political career. His wife uh, and the whole family, all the kids, go up to spend the summer in Albany because it's a little cooler the further north you go. They go upstate to visit with the family, but Hamilton stays behind uh, in the U.S. Capitol to help work out everything. Part of that agreement, by the way, was also that the Capitol would temporarily be moved to Philadelphia for 10 years while they built the new capital of Washington, D.C. So now it's not in Hamilton's hometown anymore of New York City. They've moved it to Philadelphia. Um, so while all this is happening, a woman named Mariah Reynolds shows up at Hamilton's office uh, and basically says, my husband, James Reynolds, uh, has been abusing me. He's run out on me. I have nothing. I hear that you're a man of honor. Can you please help me? And Hamilton does something really, really stupid. He says, yeah, I can help you. What's your address? I'll bring by some, I'll, I need to get some money together. I'll bring it by to your house later on and drop it off to you. And yeah, so that's where things start to go wrong because Hamilton shows up at Mariah Reynolds' house. He gives her some money and Mariah says, you know what? Why don't you hang out for a while? Let's go up to my bedroom. And they sleep together. And uh, so it happens. 
happens a few more times. Uh, the song at this point is called Say No to This. Uh, and Hamilton, the way he describes it, he's, he says, I wish I could say that was the last time. Uh, I said that last time. It became a pastime. Uh, and so they start this affair for a while. And he says in the song, he says, a month into this endeavor, I receive a letter from a Mr. James Reynolds, even better. He gets a letter from Mariah Reynolds' husband, basically saying, I know what you did. You're sleeping with my wife. If you want it to stay a secret, you're going to pay me and you're going to keep paying me. By the way, if you want to keep sleeping with her, go ahead. Just keep paying me to stay quiet about it. So, um, yeah. So this goes on for a while. But what happens is James Reynolds is a bit of a scumbag himself. And he's involved in all kinds of shady deals that are happening. And I don't want to get too off track from Hamilton's story. But one of the things that's going on in this time is that all of the veterans of the Revolutionary War were given, um, basically were given uh, bonds that were going to be redeemed after the war. Also promised land and things like that. And uh, there was a big concern that the government was going to go bankrupt and it wasn't going to be able to redeem these bonds. And so men like James Reynolds and others start going around and offering these veterans fractions on the dollar, uh, just pennies on the dollar for these bonds, so that these veterans feel like, you know, at least I'll get something on, uh, as a return on my money. Uh, because these speculators, as they were known, knew that eventually the government was going to pass this assumption plan and that these things were going to be worth their full value and they were going to make a ton of money on this stuff. And Reynolds is one of the people doing this. Well, anyway, eventually Hamilton realizes this is never going to stop. Um, and he, he ends the affair. He says, I'm not paying you anything else. You know, do what you got to do. I'm done. I'm done with the affair. I'm not cheating on my wife anymore. And I'm not paying you another cent. Well, Reynolds gets arrested because of one of his shady deals that he's going through. And he kind of starts bragging to people in jail and saying, hey, you know what? I got something on the Treasury Secretary if anybody wants to hear about it. But it doesn't really go anywhere at that time. Well, while that's happening, uh, another thing happens. And that is that, Alex, or that Thomas Jefferson, and this is one of the things that I don't like about Thomas Jefferson. Um, he hires on the State Department payroll this guy named James Callender. Uh, James Callender isn't really, I think he's hired as like a translator, but James Callender is not really being hired to be a, a, a translator. He's being hired to be uh, Thomas Jefferson's political hatchet man. Uh, and Callender sets up a newspaper uh, and starts writing these horrible things about Alexander Hamilton and the other what are known as Federalists, people who support a strong central government. Um, hey, what did you miss, Fanny? <laughs> Uh, that that's the name for those that don't know that's the name of the song where you're introduced to the character of Thomas Jefferson he comes in and says what did I miss because he's been off in France so um, anyway James Callender starts being basically the voice for Thomas Jefferson so what you have going on right now is you have the Secretary of State for for George Washington's government actively funding with government money a guy who is publishing hit piece stories against Washington's government, uh, just trashing people like Hamilton, trashing George Washington. And Callender is the guy who's doing all this. And James Callender finds out about the Mariah Reynolds affair, but he doesn't really make a whole lot of it at that time because at that time, Hamilton's pretty popular. It's just really not politically expedient for him to do that. But Calendar keeps writing these hit pieces. So he's 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 paid for with government dollars to undermine the government. It's it's pretty corrupt um, at that time. But um, anyway, so uh, fast forward through all of that. Eventually, um, at least in the Hamilton story, the way it's portrayed is that Hamilton is still 
the Secretary of Treasur Treasury when Washington decides to resign, but that's not what happens, or to, to not run again. Hamilton and, and Jefferson both leave um, after about four years. They uh, Neither one of them serves out through both of Washington's terms. Um, so Hamilton steps down mainly because he needs money, because he makes way less as the Secretary of Treasury of the Treasury than he did as a private uh, lawyer. So he needs to make some money to uh, afford the lifestyle that he's accustomed, accustomed to and to pay off some of his debts that he's accumulated. So he finally goes back to private practice, leaves government. Uh, so does Thomas Jefferson, uh, because Jefferson's already thinking about running for president when Washington's no longer in office. So fast forward a little bit to about, I think, 1797, right near the end, uh, right around the time that John Adams takes office. And James Callender starts to kind of leak the Mariah Reynolds story, but it doesn't really go anywhere. But yeah, Mr. Allegra. So One Last Time is one of my favorites as well. So the song One Last Time, which is about midway through the second act of the story, is George Washington's farewell address to the country. If you've never read it, I absolutely recommend that you should. Uh, it's one of the most beautiful uh, things ever written by uh, a person in government. It's basically Washington telling the country why he's stepping down and not serving another term. One of the best things George Washington ever did in service of this country was to not run for a third term as president. And he, he understood that. One of the brilliant things about George Washington was his recognition, being able to read the landscape and understand that he was basically viewed almost at godlike status in the country. And he needed the country to move on from him if it was ever going to move on at all. And um, so, yeah, uh, so Hamilton is invited to help. Uh, he, he's a private citizen. He's no longer on Washington's staff at this point. Uh, but Washington asks him to help write the farewell address. And so in the musical, you have Hamilton speaking the words while Washington is singing the words because Hamilton's a little more abrasive. Washington is able to say the same words and have them be received better. And so Washington, among other things, is basically saying how, you know what? I recognize I'm human. And in this farewell address, he says, uh, though I'm unconscious of any specific errors that I may have committed while president, I am too knowledgeable of my own faults, my own defects, not to believe that I must have committed many errors. It's really humble and saying, you know what? I know I'm not perfect. I'm sure I screwed up, but I did my best. And then he talks about how he says, after 45 years of service to my country, I want to step down and I want to enjoy the fruits of my labor. I want to go home to Mount Vernon. I want to be a private citizen. I want to enjoy just living under this incredible government that we've created for ourselves. And it's so tragic to realize that, that Washington died like two and a half years after he left office. All he wanted was to go home to Mount Vernon and he never got to really enjoy that. Um, Nelson, uh, when my daughter and me sung a song from this, I don't remember which one we did, but yeah, um, yeah, we'll do that again sometime. Um, yeah, the Roosevelt's decided to challenge that. Um, but yeah, uh, Washington knew he needed to step down for the good of the country, and that's what he did. Um, so he steps down. So uh, John Adams becomes president, and Adams immediately gets embroiled in some issues where he recognizes that we're going to need a gov uh, need a, a standing army. Um, and so he wants to create an army and he recognizes that there's only one person who can lead this army. Uh, and that's got to be George Washington. So here's poor George Washington who says, I just want to go home. I just want to enjoy retirement and peace. And Adams is like, Hey, Washington, we need to create an army. And you're the only person that anybody will accept in leadership of this army. And Washington says, I'll accept on one condition that you make Alexander Hamilton my chief of staff, my, my second in command. Give him the rank of major general. Give him, actually, it's, the rank was inspector general, I believe, which at that time was the uh, second in command of the army. 
Now, John Adams absolutely despises Alexander Hamilton. Even though they're kind of on the same side politically, they're both Federalists, Hamilton and, and Adams hate each other to the point where Hamilton had actively worked to make sure that Adams was not elected president. Uh, he uh, actually supported, uh, I think, Charles Pickney from South Carolina uh, and wrote a lot of anonymous articles in newspapers uh, criticizing John Adams. He tried to make sure Adams didn't get elected. Washington was in his 60s by that time. Georgia Farman, thank you for that. And hey, if you haven't already, please, everybody, make sure you subscribe to the channel. I would greatly appreciate that to this channel. Um, Washington was, I think, 67 when he died. He died of a throat infection that was probably very curable by simple antibiotics today. And it's really unfortunate uh, that he died from that. Um, but yeah, he was, he was in his 60s by that point, which was pretty old for that time and place. Uh, so Washington was put in command of the army, the army in name only. Hamilton was really the commander of the army at this point. Uh, so Adams hated Hamilton. Ha Hamilton hated Jefferson. And Jefferson hated Adams. Jefferson and Adams kind of hated each other. They had kind of a, they were like frenemies. They hated each other, but they were also friends for a while. They had been friends, then they became enemies, then they became friends again. Long story. Um, so Adams very, very reluctantly gives Hamilton the title of uh, the, the uh, rank of major general against his wishes. Uh, one of the, they were also going to appoint a series of brigadier generals. And one of the people who applied to be appointed one of those brigadier generals was Aaron Burr. But Aaron Burr was not given the title or the, the rank of Brigadier General because George Washington said, no, I don't like Aaron Burr. He served on my staff for a while. He's kind of a scumbag. He doesn't really have any principles. The only person he really cares about is Aaron Burr. No, don't make him a Brigadier General. So Burr is denied that chance. Also, I should mention, uh, going back to Mariah Reynolds, the lady that Alexander Hamilton had an affair with, she ends up divorcing her husband. Give you one guess who her divorce attorney was. Aaron Burr. So there's all of these places where Burr and Hamilton are crossing paths. Burr uh, was on Washington's staff but leaves. Hamilton ends up succeeding very good. Uh, has a lot of success on Washington's staff. They serve side by side as lawyers, but Hamilton ends up a much more successful lawyer than Burr. Um, Burr defeats Hamilton's father-in-law to become a senator from New York. Um, Hamilton and Burr find themselves on opposite sides politically. Burr ends up representing uh, Hamilton's ex-mistress in a divorce uh, trial. So all these things are happening. Um, yeah, so John Adams gets elected president. Thomas Jefferson is the vice president. Because at that time, according to the Constitution... Uh, the way it worked was the person with the most votes in the Electoral College is president. The person with the second most votes in the Electoral College is vice president. So could you imagine right now President Donald Trump with Vice President Hillary Clinton? Because that's how the system was at that time. I know it's all very confusing, J.D. I'm trying to, trying to keep it as understandable and relatable as possible. But uh, yeah, so... So then Washington steps down. He resigns as commander-in-chief of the army. So now, who's in command of the U.S. Army? Alexander Hamilton. Alexander Hamilton, Major General Alexander Hamilton, uh, is the army commander under John Adams. John Adams can't stand him, doesn't want him there, and basically has him forces him to resign as the general-in-chief of the army. But uh, Hamilton said a lot of awful things about him. Adams. Adams said a lot of things about Hamilton. There's a song in Hamilton's called uh, The Adams Administration where um, John Adams, among other things, called uh, Alexander Hamilton that Creole bastard. Uh, Thomas or John Adams was called by Alexander Hamilton uh, a fat slob. Um, people called John Adams a hermaphrodite. Uh, just awful, awful things. And so this is what was going on in politics at that time. Um, so meanwhile, the story finally breaks, courtesy of James Callender, about Hamilton's affair with Mariah Reynolds. But the problem is, 
uh, these people. And in the in the musical, it's Aaron Burr, Thomas Jefferson, and James or and James Madison, who confront uh, Alexander Hamilton about the affair in the form of we've got these check these checks that you wrote to James Reynolds. And it sure looks like you were embezzling government funds to pay for improper speculation. What do you have to say for yourself? Well, it wasn't really those three guys, but in the musical, they're not going to introduce three new characters to the story just to tell that. So they have it as three political opponents of Hamilton confront him. It was actually the um, Speaker of the House. I think uh, Frederick Muhlenberg was his name. Um, it was James Monroe was one of the other guys. And I forget who the third one was. Oh yeah. Mr. Elector. Absolutely. Dirty politics is not new. And I would argue that what was going on at this time was in some ways nastier than the worst thing you could come up with today. Politics was awful at that time. Yeah, Robert, you're right. Each elector had two votes uh, and you can only vote. Yeah. You couldn't vote for somebody from your state. And so that's where it got kind of uh, dicey. Uh, Watergate before Watergate. So Hamilton tells them what really happened. He says, listen, no, I didn't. I, I was totally above board in my role as uh, Treasury Secretary. However, I was having this affair with this lady. Here's what happened. He tells them the truth. And James Monroe takes notes from the meeting. And then somehow within a, a week or two or so, something like that, the notes from that meeting get leaked uh, publicly. And everybody hears about this. And Hamilton is livid, and he knows that Monroe's the guy who took the notes. So he confronts Monroe about it, and they get to the place where they actually are going to have a duel. Hamilton's going to duel James Monroe, the future president of the United States. James Monroe, who was a officer like Hamilton under Washington crossing the uh, Delaware. In fact, in the famous painting of Washington crossing the Delaware, in the same boat, with George Washington as young Lieutenant James Monroe, who I believe was wounded at the Battle of Trenton. Um, so, um, yeah, James Monroe must love notes. Uh, yeah, what was it was uh, Madison who was the guy who took the notes at the Constitutional Convention. Monroe takes the notes of this meeting. So, anyway, the guy who diffuses the situation is Aaron Burr. Aaron Burr is James Monroe's second for this duel. And he, he, he stops it before it comes to them shooting each other. And they kind of diffuse the situation for the time being. So I'm looking where are we in the story at this point. So some of the stuff gets turned around in the story. I'm telling things as they happened historically, not as they happened in the musical, because the musical kind of reverses some of the events uh, from what they really happened. So... Yeah, I'm going to get to Calendar, two, uh, two small bros. We're going to get to what happened to James Calendar here in a couple minutes because that's an interesting story in and of itself. Um, so anyway, so now Hamilton's no longer uh, the general-in-chief. He stepped down from that. He's actively working against John Adams. James Calendar is still writing things on behalf of Jefferson against John Adams. Uh, so now it's the election of 1800. And once again, you have... President John Adams, Vice President uh, Thomas Jefferson running against each other for president. Aaron Burr gets in the fray. Uh, and what ends up happening, long story short, uh, is that John Adams is done for. So it comes down to two anti-federalists, Thomas Jefferson and Aaron Burr. And the understanding was that when the electors voted, they were going to vote for Jefferson for president and Burr for vice president. Well, somebody didn't get the memo or somebody didn't do what they were supposed to. And it ends up a tie, a tie vote in the Electoral College for Burr and Jefferson. Well, when there's a tie in the Electoral College, the, the Constitution says that the vote goes to the House of Representatives. Well, even though by this point I should back up, Hamilton has lost most of his influence by that time because he publishes this thing called the Reynolds pamphlet. I should have mentioned that first. Hamilton writes 98 pages about his affair with Mariah Reynolds. He gives the details. Uh, he, he basically starts out, he says, the charge against me uh, is for improper speculation in connection with the one James Reynolds. My real crime was an amorous connection with his wife for a considerable time with her knowing or with his knowing consent. 
So he details the entire affair and he publishes it. But before he publishes it, he, he runs it by some of his friends and says, hey, I'm thinking about publishing this. Do you think I should? And all of his friends are like, listen, you know what? I get it. You're trying to clear your name, but I think the country is going to view 98 pages about an affair with another man's wife as a little bit worse than the accusation that most people have already forgotten about, that while you were Secretary of the Treasury, you did something you shouldn't have done. Because you're not Treasury Secretary anybody more. Nobody's really taking these accusations seriously. But he publishes this stuff. And it gets public and it just destroys his reputation. Okay, fast forward back to the election of 1800. Some of the Federalists say, you know what? We have to choose. It's either going to be Burr or Jefferson. Who do we pick? Jefferson's uh, viewed by Hamilton, even though they're enemies, as the lesser of two evils. And so he kind of qu quietly uses some of his influence to say, yeah, Mr. Electra is like, no, I know you want to come clean, but nobody needs 100 pages of detail. But you're right. Um, so, so Hamilton quietly uses some of his influences. And the way you see it in the musical is he says, if you're asking who I'd promote, Jefferson has my vote. He says, you know, Jefferson and I have never seen eye to eye on anything. We hate each other. But at least Thomas Jefferson has principles. Aaron Burr doesn't have any. Aaron Burr only cares about what works politically for him in the moment. So he supports Jefferson. Jefferson wins the election, but now Aaron Burr's vice president. Uh, so there's that. Now, here's where the story diverges from history a little bit. In the story, we are told that Hamilton's influence in that election is what ends up um, causing the duel between Hamilton and Burr. It wasn't. But what happens first is another duel. Um, John Barker Church ends up, uh, this is Hamilton's wife's brother-in-law. So Hamilton's married to Eliza Schuyler. Eliza Schuyler's uh, sister is Angelica Schuyler. Angelica's husband is John Barker Church. Church is back in America by this point, and he and Aaron Burr fight a duel. Uh, so this is Hamilton's brother-in-law. He and Aaron Burr, before Burr becomes vice president, fight a duel. They actually shoot at each other. They, they miss, and they're thinking about firing a second shot when they finally say, you know what? Okay, I'm sorry. I didn't mean what I said. Let's go our separate ways. So after having shot at each other once and missed, they, they agree to end the duel. So Hamilton's brother-in-law has already fought a duel with Aaron Burr at this point. Now what happens is Hamilton's 19-year-old son, Philip Hamilton, who's a, a student at uh, King's College, which is now known as Columbia University, by all accounts, every bit his father's son, just as brilliant as his father, has all of the same kind of aspects about his character and his intelligence that Hamilton has, um, overhears that this man named George Eaker has been bad-mouthing uh, Alexander Hamilton. And Philip Hamilton, 19 years old, goes down uh, to confront George Eaker about this. And one of his buddies also confronts, confronts George Eaker. says, hey, I heard you called my father a scoundrel. I want you to take it back right now or else we're going to have a problem. And Eaker says, no, I'm not going to take it back. It's true. And, you know, it seems like the apple didn't fall far from the tree and you're apparently a scoundrel too. So both Philip Hamilton and his buddy that was with him, I don't know his name, both challenged George Eaker to separate duels. So... Um, Eaker and this other guy fight a duel. Uh, I think they shoot at each other and miss. Same kind of deal. Uh, or maybe they never shoot. Uh, I don't remember how it goes. But basically, that duel ends without anybody getting hurt. Immediately after the first duel, now Philip Hamilton is going to fight a duel against George Eaker. And he borrows the pistols from his uncle, John Church Hamilton, who's already fought a duel with Aaron Burr. And they go to this place in Weehawken, New Jersey, right across the river. Uh, it's one of the best spots to get a view of New York City. It's a beautiful spot for a uh, view of, of Manhattan. And uh, he fights a duel with George Eaker, and George Eaker shoots Philip Hamilton and mortally wounds him. Uh, now, in the musical, you get the, the idea that Alexander Hamilton knew his son was going to fight in the duel and gives his son the instructions to fire in the air. 
and throw away his shot. And that if George Eaker's a man of honor, he'll do the same. That'll be the end of it. But um, from all historical accounts that I have read, when Alexander Hamilton found, found out that his son was going to fight the duel, that he fainted, that he was horrified. He did not think it was going to come to actually fighting a duel. Uh, so he's beside himself. Philip ends up dying of his wounds. And if you look at pictures, uh, portraits of Alexander Hamilton before his son died and just a couple of years later, it looks like Hamilton aged 20 years. He looks like just a sad man. He looks a lot like Tommy Lee Jones, actually, the actor. But you can tell that his son's death in that duel has just destroyed this man. Absolutely destroyed this man. Uh, that happened in 1801. And uh, so that all happens. And so then here's what happens. The, none of this is covered in the musical. Aaron Burr understands that he's not going to be vice president again. During Jefferson's first term, they change the law. They amend the Constitution so that you basically have a running mate. And, and it's the system as we have it today. Um. So Burr's not going to be vice president at the end of his term. So he decides he's going to run for New York governor while he's vice president. He's running for governor of New York. And yeah, Robert, you're absolutely right. At that point, Alexander Hamilton is just done with life. He's only in his mid-40s. You got to remember, at this point, he's lived a full life, but he's still only in his mid-40s. Burr runs for governor of New York, and it's in the process of his campaign for governor of New York that Hamilton is at a dinner party. And this is 1804 at this point. Hamilton's at a dinner party, and there had been some stuff published in a newspaper basically alluding to the character of Aaron Burr. People had said some anonymous things. And somebody asks Hamilton about this, and he says, you know what? Uh, at least this is what is, is claimed. It's claimed that Hamilton said, man, I could tell you things that are far worse about the character of Aaron Burr than any of that. And um, this gets back to Aaron Burr. And Burr writes a letter to Hamilton and says, uh, General Hamilton, what is this I'm hearing that you've said some, that you know some things about my character? Explain yourself. Take it back. And Hamilton, uh, uh, Jefferson's running mate for the second term was George Clinton, who was the governor of New York. Because um, he knew he needed the Federalist votes in New York to be elected gov uh, president again. So it was George Clinton. Um, so Hamilton says, you know what? I, I, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't remember saying that. But if you want to know what I said about your character, you're going to have to be a little more specific. So he doesn't deny that he said something. He just basically said, what are you talking about? Give me specifics and then I'll tell you whether or not I said that. Well, that doesn't satisfy Burr, and they start this series of letters back and forth alluding to what Hamilton said, and it escalates, and it escalates, and it escalates, and it gets to the point where Burr says, either take it back or meet me on the field of honor. And Hamilton says, well, I'm not going to take it back, so I'll see you in Weehawken. And that's where um, it, it gets to be. So uh, I should mention by this point that Aaron Burr has fathered multiple children with a woman who is not his wife. He had a daughter named Theodosia with his wife, Theodosia, who ends up dying. But while he was still married to Theodosia, he starts having uh, half black children. Uh, I, I believe it was a son and a daughter. So all of Burr's descendants who have the last name Burr are half black. Um, through his, He had a relationship with a servant of his who was born in India, who, but I believe was half African. Um, but nobody ever mentions that. You know, everybody talks about Hamilton having an affair. Well, Aaron Burr was doing the exact same thing with a servant girl while he was married and actually had children with the woman. Um, so while all that's happening, one other thing I should mention, James Callender, the guy we talked about earlier, Thomas Jefferson's hatchet man who wrote all these terrible things about uh, Hamilton and who leaked that uh, affair story, actually turned on Thomas Jefferson and started writing things about Thomas Jefferson, including during the campaign, he alludes to the fact that, hey, I know some things about how Thomas Jefferson was using government funds 
to pay for people to undermine Washington's government. Washington, uh, you know, during all that. And it was true. That really did happen. And he was all set to testify in a court case where all of this would have come out, where he was going to testify that Thomas Jefferson, who's running for re-election, this president of the United States, funded political opposition with government money. And lo and behold, James Callender shows up drowned in three feet of water. Surprise, surprise, surprise. Uh, they say he got drunk and could not rescue himself out of the three feet of water. But it, it looks, for all intents and purposes, like Thomas Jefferson or somebody else who was about to be outed uh, got epstein You know what I mean? Uh, that he was murdered to cover up what he was about to testify about. So, yeah. Mr. Alacra is absolutely right. Um, what he's saying about how the Federalists. And after John Adams, the Federalists never had another president. They did kind of devolve into the Whigs, um, but they never became a party. Exactly right. Like the Democratic Republicans did, which was Jefferson's party. Uh, and they eventually morphed into the Democratic Party. OK, so anyway, so all of this happens and Burr has challenged Hamilton to a duel. Now, his son has just died in a duel. A couple of years earlier, uh, his brother-in-law, John Barker Church, has fought a duel against Aaron Burr. Hamilton has said over and over again that his religious faith says that duels are wrong. But he's involved over and over and over again in these what are called affairs of honor. So he gets his second, a man named uh, Nathaniel Pendleton. Uh, Aaron Burr gets his second. These were the people who were going to, like your, your right-hand man, your, uh, kind of on your behalf. They row across, across the Hudson River early in the morning. Uh, Hamilton leaves a letter for his wife in, in which he, among other things, calls her uh, best of wives and best of women. Uh, he expresses to several people his intention that he's going to fire in the air. He has no intention whatsoever of hurting Aaron Burr. Meanwhile, uh, Aaron Burr, people who visited him in the weeks, because there were several weeks in between when the duel was agreed to and when they actually fought it. Aaron Burr, some people who visited Burr at this time at his house, said he was target shooting in the backyard, that he was practicing his aim with pistols so that he could be as accurate as possible. So this idea in the Hamilton musical where Burr says, uh, my fellow soldiers will tell you I'm a terrible shot. No, he wasn't. He was practicing for weeks. Um, what happened to whose father? Uh, Robert Williamson, whose father are you talking about? Uh, Aaron Burr's father or Hamilton's, uh, Hamilton's father? Oh, so Hamilton's father had died by this time. Uh, they wrote back and forth, but they never really saw each other again. But I think Hamilton's father was dead uh, by the time all these things happened. His brother, I think, also died at that point. He also had a half-brother. Uh, named uh, uh, from his uh, his his mother's later marriage, I think it was, or maybe from his first marriage. Um, but he did have another brother, a half brother, um, that he tried to support financially, who ended up coming to the states. Uh, so yeah, Hamilton's brother, uh, father James, I think, died before this point. Okay, so they fight the duel. Uh, Burr's been practicing for weeks. Hamilton insists he's not going to fire at Burr, Burr. He tells everybody this, but Hamilton's wearing his glasses. And this is what Aaron Burr claimed for decades afterwards is the reason he believed Hamilton was going to shoot him because he was wearing his glasses. Why would he wear his glasses if he wasn't looking to shoot me? So no one can agree on who fired first. They both agree that both fired. Uh, everyone agrees they both fired. Uh, Burr's shot hits Hamilton in the abdomen. Hamilton's shot hits a tree above Hamilton. Uh, everyone agrees Hamilton never aimed at Burr, but the question is, did he aim above Burr and fire, or was his gunshot a reaction to having been hit by Burr's shot, which happened first? And you can get shirts just like you can with Star Wars that say Burr shot first, you know, just like uh, the ones that say uh, Han Solo shot first or Greedo shot first, things like that. Um, no, Georgia Farman, uh, duels were far from a sure thing when it comes to aim. And also, it didn't happen the way that we think of duels. They didn't stand back to back, 
go 10 paces, and when you hit 10, you turned around and fired. You actually counted off the paces, stood facing each other, and then they would give the order to present, which meant raise your guns, and then you were allowed to fire. It was very different than the way that it's portrayed uh, most of the time. Um, but no, it doesn't need to have much velocity when you're standing 20 yards apart or whatever they were. But also, it wasn't a sure thing that you would hit. But what we do know for sure is that Burr hit Hamilton. Hamilton's shot was fired above Burr. And they actually say that as soon as Hamilton was hit, Aaron Burr actually rushed toward Hamilton, almost as though he regretted having shot him. But the, the men kind of stopped and said, okay, no, you got to get out of here. Um, they had to get him out of there. They brought a doctor right away. The doctors and everybody, in fact, most people would stand facing the other way so they could have plausible deniability and say, no, I never, sh I never saw anything. I didn't see them shoot at each other. Uh, I don't know what you're talking about. So if they testified in court, they could say they didn't see it. Hamilton's brought back. He actually lives for the better part of a day. Aaron Burr goes into hiding. The sitting vice president of the United States has just murdered one of the other founding fathers. Um, so a warrant was issued for Burr's arrest. He was charged with murder in both New Jersey and New York, but the charges were never really followed through on. Burr kind of escaped for a while, uh, left the area. Uh, Hamilton dies. And what's really sad about all this is his wife, Eliza, has just lost her son in a duel. Um, same pistols, by the way, uh, that John Barker Church used in his duel with Burr were then used by Philip Hamilton and then used by Alexander Hamilton. They were borrowed from John Church. Um, and a few months after, and also during the time that their son Hamilton, uh, Philip Hamilton died, Peggy died, Eliza's sister. And then f I think four months after Alexander Hamilton died, Philip Schuyler died. So Eliza then loses her father as well. So just a devastating time for this woman. Um, did Turn accurately portray dueling with Abe versus Simcoe? Uh, I think so. I can't remember exactly how it happened, but I, I seem to recall it being portrayed largely accurately. Okay, so um, that song where all that happens is called The World Was Wide Enough. And the reason that it's called that is because years later, uh, Aaron Burr, interesting thing, Whenever Aaron Burr would refer to Alexander Hamilton in the years that followed, and Burr lived for like an, almost another 30 years after this, um, but his political career was over at that point, Burr would always refer to Hamilton as my friend Hamilton, whom I shot. If that doesn't tell you everything about how weird that whole situation was, I don't know. But Burr only ever expressed regret over shooting Hamilton one time in his life. And I want to get the quote exactly right. Uh, because that's where the song came from. Um, but uh, it, it, the world was wide enough is the name of the song. Um, but here's what Aaron Burr said. He said, had I read Stern more and Voltaire less, I should have known the world was wide enough for Hamilton and me. And doesn't that sum it up perfectly? These men were so blinded by their beliefs, so blinded by their hatred of each other, so concerned with being right, that they couldn't see anything else. And if only Burr had understood that the world was wide enough for Aaron Burr and Alexander Hamilton and Thomas Jefferson and John Adams and everybody else, that things could have gone differently. So Alexander Hamilton dies in his late 40s, um, but his legacy largely died with him. And people pretty much forgot him if it hadn't been for one person. And that's who the last song's about, his wife Eliza. She lives another 50 years. She lives until 1854. In fact, she was one of the last connections that people had to the founding fathers, to the point where in her later years, she lived in, in Washington, D.C. And whenever somebody came to D.C., a new senator, a new president, every guy who got elected president in the 1830s, the 1840s, the 1850s, paid a courtesy call to Mrs. Hamilton at her home. Uh, and one of the people who did that was James Monroe. Monroe, when he came to Eliza Hamilton's house, he was hoping that they could reconcile. 
he was hoping that they could basically let bygones be bygones. Eliza wasn't having it. She was a strong Christian woman who believed in forgiveness, but when Monroe came to talk to her, she basically said, unless he's willing to take everything back, to apologize, to say he was wrong about my husband, I, I want nothing to do with that man. And she refused to see him. Um, so there was a lot of animosity uh, toward Monroe even then. But every founding father, uh, every president knew Eliza. One of the coolest things that Eliza does is that she helps found the first private orphanage in New York City, which still exists to this day, which is an amazing thing, uh, amazing legacy. This woman who loved her husband, this man who had cheated on her, this man who had thrown his life away in a duel, who possibly had helped their eldest son throw his life away in a duel. And, and I didn't mention their daughter, Angelica, because they didn't lose one child that day when Philip died in that duel. They lost two. Angelica had a mental breakdown as a teenager when her brother died in that duel. And it was said that after that, she was in an eternal state of childhood. She was mentally had the capacity of, of a small child for the rest of her life. And I think she lived 40 or so years after that, had to be taken care of. And that so Eliza Hamilton lost so much. And yet she spent the rest of her life honoring the legacy of her husband. It's an amazing, amazing thing that she did. And I give her all the credit in the world. What an incredible human being she was. So she starts this, um, I think it's called Graham. Graham Wyndham is the name of the orphanage. It still exists today. Founded by Eliza Hamilton and others and in honor, uh, in honor of her. Uh, I believe James Buchanan. No, not Buchanan. Uh, it would have been Franklin Pierce. Uh, was the last president to meet Eliza Hamilton. I could be wrong about that, but I'm pretty sure it was Franklin Pierce. So it was all the way up to like the 14th president of the United States met Mrs. Hamilton. Uh, others did too. I think Lincoln may have met her at some point uh, as a congressman. Uh, I'm not entirely sure of that. She helped raise money to build the Washington Monument, but she spent her whole life uh, interviewing everybody who knew Alexander Hamilton, gathering all of his letters, trying to make sense of thousands and thousands of letters and pages of things that he wrote. He left behind a ton of writing. Uh, Washington Monument, what, the construction began, I believe, in the 1840s, but it, uh, the construction was stopped during the Civil War because of funding, and it was, wasn't completed till afterwards, which is why if you visit the Washington Monument, about a third of the way up, it changes color because that's where the construction was stopped. And then they had to get the stone from a different quarry after the Civil War, after the 20 years or so that they stopped working on it. Um, so uh, Eliza does all these things to honor her husband's legacy. She never finishes it. And so her son, uh, in particular, I think John Church Hamilton, who was one of her sons, continued that legacy. Um, quite a few of her grandchildren uh, were influential in the Civil War. I believe one of Alexander Hamilton's sons was Secretary of State under Andrew Jackson, I think, uh, is when he was uh, Secretary of State. Um, I'm pretty sure James Alexander Hamilton, I want to say that to it was. Uh, yeah, several grandsons were generals in the Civil War. Um, one of Alexander Hamilton's granddaughters was married to Henry Halleck, who was the general in chief uh, of the Union Army during the Civil War. The Orphanage, exactly, Vanny. One of my favorite moments in that musical. Uh, so Mrs. Hamilton had an incredible legacy of her own uh, that deserves to be remembered. I'm, I'm probably missing so many things that I could have talked about, uh, but those are kind of the main things uh, that kind of define Alexander Hamilton. My honest opinion, one of the most brilliant men who has ever served in government certainly flawed but then again who wasn't who isn't flawed we can find flaws with every member of our government uh, every person who served in government but alexander hamilton absolutely brilliant completely underrated as a founding father and in what he did for this country uh, and how he set us up financially uh, for the abundance that we have enjoyed for the past 200 plus years um, but fatally flawed like a lot of people are who are brilliant but i would I would encourage you, if you're a reader, get Ron Chernow's biography of Alexander Hamilton. 
It'll give you so much more detail than I gave you here. It's an incredible read. It's well worth your time. I, if you read it, I think you'll end up being an as in awe of Hamilton as I am. Watch the musical if you are into those sorts of things. You'll you'll be familiar with a lot of what we talked about now. Uh, but uh, if you have ideas for the next uh, vlog like this, let me know. 